Sonic 3 found itself with the unique challenge of having two first levels. Mushroom Hill needed to be fun and welcoming for players of Sonic and Knuckles as a standalone experience, but going all bright smiles wouldn't fit within the story started in the first cartridge. That's why we begin with the ripple effects of the launch base showdown. The rhythmic chaos of the intro includes this one-time triplet on the kick drum. Followed by the chromatic tumble of the Death Egg's recent nosedive. The beat settles into its first real loop to put swing rhythm on display, which lends the track a bouncier feel than standard 4-4. Usually we count time like a steady march, where every step is of equal uniform length. But if we play this same melody with swing rhythm, it's more like skipping. Standard 4-4 takes each beat and divides it into two segments, but swing rhythm divides that same territory into three, and puts a ghost in the middle box between the notes. In other words, there's no note played in that middle spot. The presence of this ghost pause generates the da -da 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 bounciness of swing. Act 1's swing rhythm becomes more noticeable when you slow it down. Compare that to Act 2, which is all business with the steadier pulse of standard 4-4. The Zone's mushroom trampolines are the perfect conduit for the Act 1 song's elastic energy. It's a fun invitation to the Sonic & Knuckles experience that spotlights the series' awesome new character. For a lot of people, Mushroom Hill was the first opportunity to play as Knuckles, and the music is the anthem of his home territory, which he even calls back to in later games. What a sight! We have jungle mushrooms on my island too, but not this huge. Mushroom Hill Act 1 even seems to expand upon the beat from the Knuckles and Counter theme in the first cartridge. And the melodies atop this groove pay tribute to a previous first zone with a melodic nod to Emerald Hill, specifically the phrase that ends section A. Because when we disregard pitch and just consider the timing, we find this same rhythmic structure in Mushroom Hill's iconic main hook. But the chord structure underneath Mushroom Hill is a different story. In the first first zone, we enjoyed the simple, root-based clarity of Angel Island's chords moving along the circle of fifths. Mushroom Hill, then, is a logical step up in complexity. When trying to figure out the chords, the bass line is not nearly as much help since it just plays this sequence on repeat for the whole of section A. When it finally relents, it reveals the Mario Cadence, a chord progression right at home in this Mushroom Kingdom of sorts. The music of Super Mario Bros. includes the three chord sequence flat 6, flat 7, then one major for a cheerful resolution. The flat 6 generates sudden peril, like you're at the edge of a cliff. Flat 7 is a rallying of the troops to fight back, and the 1 is your home victory. In the level clear fanfare, it's a concise summary of the challenges you went through to arrive at victory. We are in a major key, but these symbols are a clue that these chords are borrowed from the minor key universe, because they don't occur naturally in the major key playground. This is fun because playing these two chords from the minor universe primes your ear to think that we must be headed toward a minor one conclusion. It's the natural and logical product of that momentum. And the Act 2 boss theme is basically a song-length articulation of this chord sequence. All that buildup culminates in the minor keyed affirmation of sinister forces, so we could call it the Eggman Cadence. But in the Mario Cadence, we swap in a major one for a more triumphant resolution. In Mushroom Hill, it's a reminder of everything we went through in the last six zones, but here we are still trucking on through. 
Yet, Mushroom Hill doesn't linger on this victorious one chord. It sort of pops in and then the rest of the measure is a funky bass accentuation that doesn't touch upon the happy major third. Because we can't celebrate yet, there's plenty more to conquer in this cartridge. And future first levels take inspiration from Mushroom Hill too. Hold on to your space-time hats, because our first stop is the next mainline game, Sonic Adventure, whose first stage, Emerald Coast, wraps up with the Mario Cadence 2. The direct sequel's first level, City Escape, uses the same chords to generate momentum that launches the iconic phrase, Follow Me. Sonic Heroes opens with Seaside Hill to show how you can use the Mario Cadence to build up to the one, but then immediately dash away. Sonic 06 got the music right, starting with the first zone. Wave Ocean's chords give Sonic enough steam to outrun that orca. That example makes the Mario Cadence a climactic moment of the song, but Sonic Color's Tropical Resort shows how you can sneak it in under the radar. Now, considering the fact that it's also in Sonic Lost World's Windy Hill, then by this point, it's just gotta be in Sonic Force's first zone Lost Valley, right? How long does it take to come across one? Such frequent recurrence of these Mario chords reminds us that Sonic is a revision of Nintendo's formula. And the thing about revisions? They tend to improve upon the first draft. Sonic & Knuckles' whole soundtrack operates heavily in the minor key universe, and even major keyed songs like Mushroom Hill contain numerous minor elements for a subtly darker edge. In the melody scales, the three can be either major or minor, and Angel Island showed the importance of the three when defining the cheeriness or seriousness of each act. In Mushroom Hill, both acts are in a major key, but dashes of the minor third make for a more nuanced story. But it's not that Mushroom Hill switches between happy sections and sad sections. Unlike Angel Island's blatant dichotomy, both acts of Mushroom Hill use the major third as the main character, but this playful use of the minor third makes the eventual major third resolution from above all the more reassuring. Here it is in sequence. Ocean Palace from Sonic Heroes has a similar composition template. The climax contains the Mario Cadence and a similar dash of minor 3 to 1, then resolving from above from the 4 to the major 3. This one particular bar goes all in on the melancholy. If you listen to this melody in isolation, it's a straightforward 5-3-1 outline of a minor triad chord. Yet this is snuck into Mushroom Hill without turning the chorus into a downer. Teeing up this minor triad right before the ultimately encouraging major resolution tells a micro story in itself. The melodic narrative is the same between Acts 1 and 2, but the drums vary significantly, and not just due to swing rhythm. Take the snare drum. It's the drum that pops, often at the moment it feels natural to clap. A traditional rock drum beat has snares on beats 2 and 4. One, two, three. One, two, three. And watch this concert goer clap on each snare. Most of Act 1 keeps snares on beats 2 and 4, making for a safe, sturdy beat to open the game. But Act 2 gets more ambitious, with snares in any number of different spots. Compared to the casual bounciness of Act 1, Act 2 has a more rigid, almost military drive. The drum solo that opens Act 2 sets the stage immediately. And later on, we get bursts of double time, like what Balloon Park had. Mm -hmm. 
This creates a heightened sense of energy that pumps you up for the spiked bars boss that none of the kids in our neighborhood could beat. And another differentiation is the two acts use of toms. A drum set might have two or three toms, and it's not that each tom plays different notes on a scale, but they are pitched differently, such as the high tom, low tom, and when needed, the C-137 tom. Act 1's prevalent toms generate a foresty jungle atmosphere, which is comparable to Donkey Kong Country's track DK Island Swing, with its heavy use of swing rhythms played on toms. But the jungle party ends in Act 2. The toms are dismissed, and we drill down to the pure business of just the kick and snare. It might sound like the drums and bass are each starting to do their own thing, but for the most part they move in lockstep. At first, the bass line does have these five syncopated notes, which maneuver in between the steady downbeat activity of the drums. But ultimately, we return to order. The next measure sees both instruments neatly in alignment for each note change. We have Ardclaw to thank for these drum insights. Here he is on the hill to show us what snares and toms can do.